All right, good evening, one and all. I appreciate you being here this evening. My name is Salvatore Seely, and I am Health and Wellness Program Director at Camp Rehoboth. I'm excited, I'm so excited to bring you the first in a three-part series of Our Haunted History with Dr. Carol Polio during the month of October. Next week, we will be live from the Brick Hotel in Georgetown, Delaware on October 13th at 7 p.m. I hope you all can join us. I'll put the link in the chat box that will take you to our registration page. Before we start, I just wanted to go over a couple of technical details. The workshop is being held on location, so there might be some technical issues. If something happens that is not supernatural, please have patience with us. There's a question and answer box on the bottom if you hit the chat button. At the end of the presentation, there'll be time for questions and answers. Please type your questions for Dr. Carroll, and we'll, we'll get to them if we have time. We're so excited to bring you our haunted history live at the Bewitched and Bedazzled Bed and Breakfast in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Thank you to the innkeepers, and especially to Inez, for letting us be here tonight and allowing us to share the story of your B&B. You can check out the B&B at www.rehobothbnb.com. You're in for a treat this evening with Dr. Carol Polio. Dr. Carol is founder of Intuitive Investigations and currently is director and lead investigator. She realized her abilities as a clairvoyant as a preteen. As often the case, she struggled with the influx of psychic information from those around her and the spirit world, ultimately deciding to push those abilities aside to pursue a career in science. Despite her efforts to downplay her abilities, visions, and premonitions, they continue to make their way into her life. Over the years, those experiences prompted her to begin investigating the paranormal and tapping into her clairvoyance by providing insightful personal readings for family and friends. So thank you all for joining us. And I am gonna hand this over to Dr. Carol. Thank you. Hey everybody, welcome. I'm so glad to see everybody here. Um, I have some areas I wanna talk about. And then after I talk a little bit about how I investigate and the history um, of this site where we are and what we found, um, I'm going to play a few recordings for you, go over a little bit of data just to give you a taste of it, and then we'll have questions. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, one of the first things is how I investigate. And I try to take a scientific approach because that is my background. I retired as a chief scientist. And I have some equipment laid out here that I will talk about. The basic equipment that I use is a recording device, which is something that everybody has now because everybody has a phone. So recording is actually one of the best tools you can have. I also brought with me, I'm gonna reach over there once in a while just to show. I brought also a K2 meter um, that reads EMF uh, readings, which are electromagnetic frequencies. I have a more sophisticated mel meter next to it. I'm not gonna pick it up because it will go off and I don't want to do that. Um, and those are really basic things. But I also like to use um, a pendulum to ask questions. So I have that here. And in some of these locations, I have to look around for my, I use dowsing rods, there they are. And the reason I use dowsing rods is because, I don't know if you know what dowsing rods are for, dowsing water is what they used to be used for. Um, but I deal with history, and so I deal with historic sites primarily. And sometimes spirit is more comfortable with something like a dowsing rod. They recognize them right away. So that's why I use those. Um, and I give spirit, as I call them, a choice. One of the things that I um, don't do is you won't hear me refer to spirit as ghosts because, frankly, I feel like that's a little bit disrespectful. And that's because these are our predecessors, our ancestors. So I try to be respectful and I really enjoy these historic sites. So there are higher tech 
it, there's a higher tech equipment. I don't have it all here with me today. I do have this on and we've been getting some responses from um, who we believe is Rear Admiral um, Charles Sigsby in this room. This is the Humphrey Bogart room. Typically I um, investigate with students. I teach a class at Delaware Tech mm -hmm. um, in Georgetown. And when I teach that class, um, part of the class is an investigation. So I do that and it's kind of fun. And we do historic sites because honestly, I love the spirits at historic sites. And they're interesting. They have an interesting story. And I have done some public investigations with uh, Lewis Historical Society, for example, um, in the past and hope to do some in the future um, once we're all able to get out and about. But this focus on history really drives me. My career um, was uh, as a chief scientist, it was in the National Park Service. So history became very important in everything I did, even though I was on the environmental side of science. Those two things are always interrelated when you're dealing with national park sites. So about this location, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we are and some of the things that are important about it that will tie into some of the data that we were able to collect when we've been here in the past to investigate. Um, Rehoboth Beach, I'm not a historian, so bear with me, was born in, was born in 1873. Um, Reverend uh, Robert Todd decided that he had been to Ocean Grove, New Jersey um, as kind of a retreat because he was exhausted from doing his uh, religious camp activities and decided that he needed a place to do that. Um, and so he became so obsessed, it's really interesting to me, he became so obsessed with finding a place to do his um, church retreats mm -hmm. that he even dreamed of the location. Mm -hmm. So when he came down the coast, he was looking anywhere between New Jersey and basically like Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay, looking for a place to have his retreat area, he um, got to this area and he said, this is the place that I saw in my dream. So that's kind of interesting that he had chosen this location, came out to see it. And it was exactly what he had seen in his dream. That was in 1873. And that's when the boardwalk here was built. Um, in 1878, the railroad um, extended to Rehoboth Beach. So people, it went right down Rehoboth Avenue, so people could get off the train right there um, at the beach. And when he built his um, camp meeting place, they built, they called them tents, but they were little wooden cottages, little tent houses. And they built them, many of them, and the town of Rehoboth is actually built purposely like a fan and fanned out and had at that time wide streets. So if you look at a map of Rehoboth Beach from above, you will see this fan pattern, which is just very interesting. Um, when over time they've had, they had to move at one point um, to the second block of Baltimore Avenue, which is right near here, and that became the new center. And they moved a lot of those little cottages around. And over time, that's one of the um, difficulties doing investigations here is one of these uh, bed and breakfast locations that we're in right now is in its original spot as far as we know, but the other one is not. It was moved from a different location. So when you're trying to research and do historic research and find out who might have lived or died or you know been attached to, meaning emotionally attached to these residences, you have to find them <laughs> to figure out where they came from. So um, that was 1878 when the railroad came in, 1881, they discontinued the formal meetings. Now in 1889, we're in the Humphrey Bogart room. And in this room, um, we have chatted with who we believe is Rear Admiral Charles Sigsby. Now in 1898, he was the commander of the USS Maine, which exploded in Havana Harbor. And that actually began the Spanish-American War. But it was just the next year, so just a year after that. Okay, so he's gone through that, gone through a big investigation and everything. His daughter was here at the beach 
um, kind of recuperating. She had been ill over the winter. She was 13 years old and she died here in um, the, the Bewitched, which is the building next door to us. So she passed there at 13. Um, very, very quickly, she seemed to be getting better and then she got very ill. And at that time, you have to remember too, that a lot of people came to the beach, not just, they didn't go swimming, but they came to breathe the salt air and to recuperate from a variety of different diseases. So she was here, her father couldn't make it back. So that was just a year later. Um, some of the other things that we have found here, um, talking to, again, this was in the other building, um, some of the help that were here that were living up in the attic. So we have some information maybe about someone who was um, working here. The canal was finished in 1916. 1925 was when there finally was a paved road from Georgetown here. So in 1925 is when this we really kind of exploded. People didn't have to come already. It was big enough with the train, but once the road was put in, that's when people started referring to Rehoboth Beach as the nation's summer capital. Mm -hmm. So people were able to get here so quickly because they now had a road. Um, skipping forward to 1946, um, we did have communication with someone who um, we believe there's an elderly woman that's in um, the home, the other, the other house as well. And um, we believe we know who she is. So we'll talk a little bit about her. And there were children. We also found children over there. So a lot of different things going on. In this case, um, we're with Rear Admiral Sigsby here, and he did not make it back to see his daughter. So I think he has some unresolved issues there. Mm -hmm. um, but he's really uh, an interesting person to communicate with, primarily with the pendulum or the dowsing rod. But the pendulum worked really well with him. Um, but we also have some recordings using some other equipment. So as I get into the, the findings, what I did was, um, given our format, I chose basically five different recordings for you. So that, that way, hopefully, you'll be able to hear them. Typically, when you record um, uh, electronic voice phenomena in EVP, typically, you don't even hear it with your ears it's on the recording or it's on the video. Mm -hmm. So you, I get lots of data work where I have to go and search through all the data in my headphones. So what happens is in this location, um, in just a two hour time period, when we investigated here, we got 22 different responses. So well, that's quite a few. Mm -hmm. The issue is that it's easy to hear them with headphones, it's easy enough to hear them. It's a lot harder to hear them through your speakers. So I would encourage you um, to, and and I'm sure that we could post this um, in a chat room or whatever, to go to my Intuitive Investigations YouTube page where I have the recording. So you could put headphones on and you could listen for yourself, but I will play some for you. Um, but that is one of the challenges is that, um, you have to listen and then I have to make the sound louder so that it can be played. So these are ones that were either loud enough or I was able to make them loud so that you could at least hear the responses that we get in a typical investigation. So that's what we're going to talk about. So let me pull that up for you. All right, so are we all good and we can see that? So let me talk about, again, go over a kind of a summary of what um, we saw when we came here, or we heard about that. Um, in this room here, this is the Humphrey Bogart room. We had a conversation with Rear Admiral Sigsby. Um, across and below in the other bed and breakfast, we um, heard the daughter Eleanor, I want to talk a little bit about her because she's kind of interesting. Um, she was seen as a full body apparition by the woman that worked here. So 
typically uh, an investigation, I don't do an investigation unless I have enough information before I go. I don't just go to old, weird, or scary places because I don't feel like that's productive, but also it's not really an investigation then. It's kind of just what they call a ghost hunt. And I don't do that. I kind of want to have some information first. Mm. So that was a full body apparition that we believe was Eleanor that was seen. So that's some of the evidence. There's other evidence from interviewing people about their experiences here and what they've felt and heard, but that's huge to have someone she was doing laundry. She looked out in the, the hallway because she thought there was a guest there. And she thought she was in the way. So she was going to move the door so that the guests could go by. And she looked and she saw this young girl standing out in the hallway. And then when she went to move the door and turned around again, the young girl was gone. So that's who, why we believe that, that Eleanor is here in the first place. We may... Um, see Mary Ellen and the other thing too to say we may have uh, talked to Mary Ellen which is her sister um not all spirit is is in one place there's a whole lot of different explanations for this but the bottom line is some stay in a place they choose to stay we call it earthbound um so earthbound they stay some come and go like you cross over and you come back and many people have had that experience with someone, say an elderly person, a grandmother passes and then you feel them around you. Um, mm -hmm. Typically they have cross, crossed over, if you will, I, whatever your belief system is, they have gone where they go and they're able to come and visit and provide comfort. So that's another thing. A third option, sometimes people are attached to objects and you can see just a little bit behind me, but in these two bed and breakfasts, there is amazing, an amazing amount of collectible mm -hmm. items that belong to the stars, that belong to the, the people who, um, the actors and actresses of Bewitched, these movie stars, Hollywood. So there are a lot of objects also. So that's why you see in this list some people that you would say, well, why would Judy Garland be there? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's, a lot of memorabilia of hers here and maybe things, something she owned, something she might be attached to. So there's a lot of different reasons you might have spirit here. It isn't just because someone passed on in the building. They don't have to have done that. They may be here um, for other reasons. For example, the Admiral, he may be here because, and he has said to us, he wanted to visit his daughter. He missed seeing his daughter before she passed. And so this is, he visits, they visit here. And that's what he would have done in the summer at Rehoboth Beach. She would come down and stay and he would come down and visit. And that's because he and his wife were not together at that time. So that was the only time where he could spend a lot of time with his daughter and children. So um, Judy Garland, um, an interesting thing is Sister Mary June, um, because as I mentioned earlier, that the, uh, the Rehoboth Beach Camp Meeting Association of the Methodist Episcopal Church is the name of the camp that was here originally. Uh, I did some research on the Methodists and John Wesley founded the Methodists. And at that time, just a, one of those facts that you find when you research, um, they called each other, the parishioners, if you will, called each other sister and brother. And so while we were here, we weren't even aware of that information, but we did get a response um, from someone who said brother, and then we were talking to Mary June, who had told us she was a sister. She was a, you know, sister and brother were terms used by that particular church. And we also um, saw, talked to Mrs. Hudson, and she's the more recent, and several small children are also running around in the hallway and pulling blankets off people in the other building as well. So the interactions we had spanned from the 1890s to at least the 1940s and the Mrs. Hudson that we connected with, we don't have a time frame, but it could have been as much as even 20 or more years, 30 more years later, I don't know. She lived in, in the house. So, you ready to hear some sound? <laughs> Hopefully it's set up. You tell me if you can't hear it, um, somebody. 
Um, and this is a picture of Rear Admiral Sigby. And this is a recording where we asked him um, if he was here. And then I'll repeat what he said if you can't hear it. So I'm asking, where is Admiral Sigby? Are, are you here today, Admiral Sigby? And he's saying, where would I be? So they also have a sense of humor. I just want to say that sometimes they can really uh, tell you something you didn't know. All right. So that's the first one um, where we got a response from him. When we were downstairs, um, hoping to get a picture, to get a video, to get something of Eleanor. Um, we didn't get that, but that happens. Sometimes you don't get it. Um, if you watch paranormal TV, don't believe it, that they get videos of everything, okay? Because it's one of the hardest things to get is a video. Even a picture is hard. I have a few, few pictures. Um, and I use old school uh, photography. I use what we used to be Polaroids, but they're called different cameras now. Uh, but the instant film is the film that I've caught really the best images on, but not from this site. So you'll just have to see what happens because I have some from the other site we're going to next week. So <laughs> come back. So this is, um, we were asking about whether um, Eleanor was here with us downstairs in that hallway. Um, and again, sometimes, I mean, there's lots of other spirit around. There are what we call drop-ins. So there are drop-in spirits and those spirits um, will say all kinds of things, but you can often tell if they're modern. In this case, we just get a one word answer, but it's not Eleanor that's answering. So oh, it's quiet, but are you out in the hall there, Eleanor? And the response is probably not. And it's a male voice, so we don't know who that is that might be saying that. Yeah. All right, <laughs> so, sorry, I skipped ahead. Technical malfunction. Um, so this is about the um, camp meeting association, the religious camp. And so we were actually in the downstairs here in the owner's quarters asking questions about the area and who might be there because she has had issues with, uh, she had woken up once and an old woman's face was right above mm -hmm. her face and just startled her awake but that someone was leaning over the bed looking at her. And while we were in that room, the, the light the light kept coming on and off while we were sitting there doing, and this is daytime. I mean, you know, light outside investigation. You don't have to investigate in the dark. That's kind of a myth that, you know, the only reason you would investigate in the dark would have to would be if the activity that is observed only happens at a certain time of day, or you might uh, investigate at night if it's the only time an area is quiet. Like here, there might be a lot of street noise, so maybe you'd want to investigate during the day. So you don't have to investigate at night. So we were investigating during the day, but the light was still going on and off as we were doing that. So we're asking who is in this room, um, and uh, this is the response that we got. It's a little hard to hear. So is anyone here with us? We'd like to hear who you are. And one said brother and the other said Mary June. So she had been, we had been conversing with her about being sister Mary June. And then what we do is we'll turn on this equipment, which is called a spirit box. Um, and so it's just another way to get answers. So we were taping to get answers on the, um, the, EV, the true EVP, the uh, electronic voice phenomenon that you would get on a tape on a tape recorder, a recording device. <laughs> but then we use the spirit box, which is sends a electric, gives them an electric signal, electronic uh, frequency for them to speak through. So this is them speaking through that. I had no idea until I researched it, but I started thinking about why are brother and sister, what kind of religious camp was this and what, why would that be? And that's how I found out about how they um, 
called each other brother and sister and how unique it was at that time because it was giving women a full role, you know, more of a full role in the, um, in participating in the, uh, the camp and the, and the religion, but that was John Wesley when he founded Methodist. So I just thought that was really interesting because um, it's different. So then this was also down in the, uh, the quarters and um, previous tenants had said that they thought Marilyn Monroe was present. So that would have been interesting. <laughs> Don't wanna disappoint you. <laughs> but, um, so we asked the question is, and this is actually the owner asking the question if Marilyn Monroe is present. So the answer is no, Marilyn Monroe is not, not in this room. And so um, this, this last one here is about, um, it's up in the attic room, which would be the servants' quarters. And um, I find that mo many places, historic places I go to, um, the attic and then sometimes the basement are very interesting places because uh, the spirit that's there I mean, these are people that work very hard. They had a difficult life sometimes. So you get some very interesting responses. And in this case, um, up in this room, which is now the um, uh, Aunt Clara room. So this is in the Aunt Clara room in Bewitched. Um, this, we had a long conversation with this woman. In fact, at one point, um, I have another recording where we, there was someone sitting next to me and that's what they said. You know, people felt a cold draft come by and we said, is somebody over here? And they said, you know, yes. So somebody was sitting right next to me. Um, so this is asking about the help. And um, this is not that room. This is just a, um, uh, room that I found that would look similar. What this woman said to us was that three adults and several children lived in the same room. So the small room is where all of these people would live. Um, and they worked um, for the owner of the house at the time as, as a servant or help. And this is the uh, response that we got. Right. And this is significant because the house across the street was owned by the Wright family. So, you know, as we were going through and doing this investigation, the owner said, well, the Wrights lived across the street. So this person who worked here in the summer, that's kind of a little bit of evidence that they, we are talking to someone who historically lived and worked in this house versus what I said earlier about drop-ins. And you get some really interesting drop-ins that are uh, people that are able to, I don't really know how they do it, but they do figure out that we're investigating and they do come, are drawn to this. Excuse me, Dr. Carroll. Answer, yes. Can you do me a favor? Can you unshare your screen? And then when you bring it back up, there should be a button that says share uh, sound. Oh, okay. So uh, stop share. Yep, I know how to do that. And then bring it back up to share. And then on the bottom, it should have a button that says yes. include sound. I'm sorry, I didn't check those. What was the name of the family that you worked for? Is that better? What was the name of the family that you worked for? So, okay. Well, I think that is the, actually the last one. So. If you want, um, yes, it is. I can go back and play those again if you want to hear those again. Does that just take a second? Is Marilyn Monroe in this room? Is Marilyn Monroe in this room? So it's it's subtle, but if you had headphones on, you'd hear it even stronger, louder. Is there anyone who would like to speak with us? We'd like to hear who you are. <laughs> Is there anyone who would like to speak with us? We'd like to hear who you are. All right. 
Are you out in the hall there, Eleanor? Are you out in the hall there, Eleanor? Probably not. A little quieter. And then this one. So is Admiral Sigby here today? Oh dear, where would I be? So is Admiral Sigby here today? Sorry about that. That's my fault. I know to do that, but I forgot. <laughs> All right. Um, we ready for questions? So if anyone has any questions at this time for Dr. Carroll, if you want to put those in the chat box, that would be great. So any questions? All right, don't be shy. All right, I'm going to check on Facebook to see if we have a question. So we do have one question for you, Dr. Carroll. Let me pull that up. All right. And the question is how, if you're, if you're experiencing any paranormal activity, how do you get the spirit to leave your home? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, typically, it's a really simple answer, and most people don't. Because they're in a situation, I have been in this situation where before I knew what I know, I was in a, in a um, living in a place that was haunted um, and I was petrified. I mean, I, I will now look back on it and say, oh, that wasn't really bad, but it was to me, so I understand that. Um, I always recommend the first thing to do is to talk to the spirit that's there, to acknowledge that you hear them, you know they're there. Um, that they're disruptive to you and you would like them to, to leave. I will say that high 90% of the time, there's someone that you know, that's someone that is trying to contact you and they have no sense of how obnoxious they're becoming. They don't, you know, they, people talk about a veil, like they can't see us. And I'm not really sure what it is because I haven't been there, but, um, <laughs> There is some kind of a filter between the worlds, if you will, that they can't always tell. They can't gauge that you're reacting or interacting with them until you do so directly. So a lot of times I will find people that have very active things going on and they are petrified and they're very scared. And I don't blame them because I have been myself when I lived in that situation and didn't know what was happening. And it turned out that it was someone that they knew. Um, typically when I talk to someone on the phone, honestly, I can tell what kind of what's going on for them um, and sit down and talk to them and say, look, I know you're here. I acknowledge that you're here. Um, it doesn't, you can even set boundaries and say, I don't mind that you're here if you were trying not to get rid of them and say, but I, you can't wake me up at night or you can't do these things because they scare me. Or if you want them to go, you tell them that they need to leave, that it's not their home or no longer their place to be. And you, you need them, you need to be a little more forceful, not forceful, but just say, I need you to go because you're not, you're not wanted here. Okay? But you don't ever raise your voice, you don't yell, you don't do anything like that because that's you know, kind of inciting anger and you don't know yet, maybe you don't know who or what you're dealing with. So I never recommend Yelling. That's another thing that sometimes you see on, used to see a lot on paranormal shows, a lot of yelling going on and telling, don't do that. Don't challenge, just say, this is my home now. You're not welcome here anymore. You need to leave. So that's what I would do is, is you have to have a conversation as if you're talking to a person sitting in front of you. That's works most of the time, honestly. Any other questions? Yes. Um, where did you work as a chief scientist and what was your prior training and specialization? <laughs> as a career scientist myself, 
I'm curious what background you bring to these investigations now. Thank you. Sure. Um, I was in, an, well, environmental science, because that's what my PhD is in environmental science. Um, and, uh, but natural sciences, wildlife, I'm a professional wildlife biologist. So I spent a lot of time out in the field. I also spent um, a lot of time, I closed uh, 11 abandoned mines. So I worked a lot with the history and some of the goings on. And so I did actually um, note some activity that was going on in some of these uh, old mining towns that I worked on. Um, so that's kind of, it's, it's wildlife, but it's also in the National Park Service. So I was responsible for all, all aspects of the environment, including what I would call the end of the pipe, type of environmental work, water quality, you know, air quality. Um, but my personal um, background uh, qualification is, is wildlife management um, and uh, wetland science, so a lot of swamp work, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So that's my background. Um, is it related? In some ways, it's related in the environmental sense of uh, looking at a building and trying to uh, make sure that that cool breeze people are feeling isn't, you know, the HVAC system, or there isn't an infrasound problem, which is the sound that um, they associate often with um, wind turbines, things like that. So some knowledge helps with that, um, but most of it goes back to having had experiences myself, uh, living in a park in an old officer's club building that was interesting. Um, and that was my first experience at 20. And my first job was that the building that they put me up in temporarily was definitely haunted. Got other stuff? Uh, we do have one question, yes. or a couple, actually two more questions. Um, is there a better time of the day to do this? I've seen shows where people do this in the middle of the night into the early hours of the morning, or can what you're doing now be done during the day? Um, I talked a little bit about that earlier. It can be done during the day without a problem. In fact, most of the time I do investigations, I do them during the day. The exception would be if the activity you're investigating, if someone tells you that something happens every night at midnight or every morning at three in the morning, then that's the, the one exception, one of the exceptions where you have to be there at that time to experience what the person reporting to you is experiencing. That's one reason. The only other reason would be noise. So I've done a lot of work on the Cannonball House, for example, in Lewis. Mm -hmm. It's right on the main street. Mm -hmm. And during the day, it's so busy. In fact, it's busy till after the dinner crowd goes home, till the bar is closed. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're in a place where there's a lot of noise, mm -hmm. then sometimes you do have to investigate um, at night, like midnight. And um, I was with, um, I'm still with Maryland Paranormal Research, even though I have my own um, investigation. Um, I don't know if you want to call it a business. I don't really do, do things that way. But, um, and when I'm with, was with them, um, we would always go to the two or three in the morning, which is exhausting. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the later you go at night, I'll be honest with you, the more drop-ins you have and the more drop-ins you have, the less, for me, valuable information I'm getting because those are typically modern spirits that drop in. So at two in the morning, all we're getting is, um, I don't even want to share this, but I will, I'll share it. We get F-bombs and stuff. We get mm -hmm. people just being troublemakers. So frankly, being up in the middle of the night isn't necessarily um, helpful, but it does depend on what your, um, what your purpose is. My purpose is typically either it's historical um, research, so during the day is, is perfect for that, or um, if, if it's for an individual that has a, has a problem and I know that there's a problem there, and again, if I need to be there at a certain time, that's when it happens, I have to be there. But other than that, no. Um, if you do go and look at YouTube, for example, all the stuff that I have, 
most of it is either during the day or uh, my classes, we go from seven to nine at night. That's it. So no, it doesn't. That's the only two reasons that it matters, whether it's nighttime or daytime. What else you got? So we've got one observation. We have one of our participants has a very like deluxe uh, pair of headphones on. Yes. And what they're reporting is that they hear a woman moaning softly through their earphones. <laughs> and then the other question <laughs> to reach out to someone who has died. Is that advisable or not advisable? And how can you tell if you were trying to reach out to someone, if that was the person that you were trying to reach out to? Um, one thing I would say about reaching out to someone who has died, I'm assuming it's someone that you're very close to related to. Um, I would be very careful about doing that in your home, mm -hmm. just because um, I, I wouldn't want something to happen where you get drop-ins or you get somebody that's not that person. Um, but I mean, it's possible what I have found. I mean, there are a lot of people that um, obviously I, most people, I know a lot of people that have passed on probably more than most just because of my family history. Um, and there are some people that even with everything that I have and my abilities and everything, I don't, I won't hear from them. Just don't. I, I can't explain why some you hear from, some you don't. There's a, a lot of explanations on why that is so. When people, my belief, I always make sure to tell you what my belief and what I've been taught is that when someone leaves um, to go to their next assignment, <laughs> if you will, wherever they go, um, they go to a, something I call, I call soul school. And that means that, you know, you've heard of people talk about life review and that sort of thing. And so sometimes you might be wanting to reach out to someone and they're not available because they are doing their life review. So not, a lot of people want to reach out right away and they want to talk to someone right away that's passed on. And often that's just not possible because, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is, but often it's not because they're in this life review, and I call it soul school, where you're, you're going over everything and, you know, um, looking at everything that happened in, in their life. So sometimes there's a time period, because I have a friend that passed that I didn't hear from, for, you know, and I didn't try really. But eventually now I understand that she's around, but I don't really communicate with her. I just know that she's gone wherever she's gone. But I, it was nothing for a year, at least, that I just, there was just nothing. Um, I, I'm not as concerned as much about bringing in um, someone that isn't that person, but again, it would be very hard for you to know if it's really that person. So that's why, you know, sometimes it's best to, um, to wait some time and see um, if you uh, start noticing them. The other thing you could do is you could ask, you know, I don't know if you'll get what you want, but you could ask um, if you are around, could you do something for me? Could you show me a sign that you're around with me? And that, a lot of people do that very successfully. But again, in that first year or so, it's not likely that you'll get that. But you might be able to get at least a sign from somebody that it's them. And that would be, mm -hmm. you've probably heard about signs, things like a, like a feather, or maybe there's something that means something to you or maybe a coin that has their date of year of birth on it or something would appear. So you might have something that you share and say, well, if it's you, we had this experience, you know, put something like that in front of me so I know that you're there. You know, we had some connection over a place that we visited. So you ask for that place name, you know, or just, just pop that into in front of me and I'll know that's where you are. And you go out and a week later, you see a billboard for that place that you went. See? So sometimes you can ask for a sign, but I would be a little bit cautious. I would not um, just openly do this kind of investigation in your home. I don't do that. I'm not inviting anybody to my home. 
<laughs> you know, um, I'm not afraid. It's more, I mean, why would I want to do that more so for other people, not just for me, but I don't do that. I don't investigate in my own home. So just, I would say if it's someone you know really closely, you might, you might try asking. Or again, you have that waiting time where you might not, even someone who is skilled at speaking with them may not be able to communicate with them because they won't be available. So hopefully that helped. Do you want to? Any feedback, any other questions? Yes, we have two final questions. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever felt fearful, uh, fearful during your experiences? And then the other question is, have you ever encountered many pets that have stayed on as a presence? <laughs> yes and yes. Um, I have not felt fearful investigating. Okay, that, that is not, but I'm in a very different place now than when I had my first experience. And I was 20 and I was in that old officer's club. I was petrified. Mm -hmm. um, I heard, uh, because it was happening in my room, so I was, would lay down to sleep at night and something would start banging in my room. And that happened on two, two nights, three, three or four times each, so it wasn't going away. Um, I moved the thing that it was banging on because I, I, please, you don't want this here, I'll move it. I did look into it and um, I was very afraid. And honestly, at night I would hear, then I would hear footsteps going up and down. And there was a grand staircase in this particular officer's club, this old officer's club, and there was no one else there. So I would hear that. And I literally slept with a pillow over my head. I was so scared. Um, I did talk to someone who lived there and he said that he had um, sometimes the faucet turned on in his bathroom and he would have knocking on his door and he would open the door and no one would be there. So, but they would be, ta but they would be talking. He could hear someone talking, but nobody visually was there. So when I asked him what they said, and he said regular stuff. That's all he told me. So I have no idea what regular stuff is. I was very scared then because I had no idea what to do. Um, now on investigation, no, I will say that I do not go to places where um, spirit is unhappy and not at rest. What I say about those places are, we're talking about prisons, asylums, mm -hmm. those kind of, you know, I don't do those kind of investigations. And I will tell you, I don't do them because um, I don't like to investigate someplace where when those people were alive, they were literally dying to get out of them. Mm -hmm. So if those spirits are there, they're really anxious to come out with you, come back with you. So, and if you're in any kind of situation like, you know, drinking alcohol, using drugs, um, sick, not well, just had a big fight with your spouse and you go to a place like that, you are much more likely to find a friend or not a friend to bring home with you. So um, I don't go to those places, but I've not, I've not been scared. And you said the other one was about pets. And yes, I've had some really wonderful experiences with pets, um, not my own, but um, one of the sites we're gonna go to has a spirit animal. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're gonna go, we're still working on it, um, but it has a spirit animal, not a dog or a cat. I'm not even, I'm not gonna give it away. <laughs> But um, on, I have a house, uh, uh, another house in Greenwood, Delaware. And at that house, um, I was walking back from the mailbox, which is a good walk on a driveway, closed in with trees and all. And my partner was next to me. And in front of him, I swear to you, in my mind's eye, I saw a big black lab. And this big black lab was jumping around and wanted to play ball. You know what they do, right? They're jumping around, I wanna play ball, I want your home from work. That's what I saw. And I said to him, you know, there's a big black lab in front of you. <laughs> he wants to play. And he says, I know. Anyway, I just, I was like, what do you mean you know? What does that mean? And I, I said, his name is Bo. And so I have this big dog at this house. He's there. Um, a couple of months, Maybe a year, maybe a year later, I brought a friend over there. We were working on the house. Nobody was in the house. He was a medium. He walked in the back door with me and he said to me, 
is there's not a dog here, is there? And I said, why? What did you see? And he said, well, there can't be a dog. You're not living here. And I said, what did you see? And he said, I saw this big dog in the, you know, it was the laundry room, standing in the laundry room. And when, when we came in, it just kind of, it's not there. I don't know where it went. And I said, yeah, his name is Bo. And he said, yes, his name is Bo. <laughs> he said, that's what he got too. Um, my little dog that's there, well, she's just passed and now she's out there, I suppose. But when she was still alive, she would be out in the yard and her tail would go up and wag and she would look up because she was little. She would look up and like she was playing, like she was checking mm. out another dog. So we used to say she was playing with Bo. Mm. Um, so yes, there are uh, spirit cats at a, a plantation that I did a public event at. They were doing the, it's a big wedding venue and they're doing the pictures for the um, brochure. And when they looked into the pictures, there were two cats mm. in the window of the um, plantation. So yes, pets do come back and visit. Uh, most of them are, they visit and they come and go when you need them. Um, so I've had um, quite a few encounters with pets and because they're comforting, comforting spirits. So yes, long answer to your question, but absolutely cats, dogs, other animals, for sure. So thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. We had a very good evening and we're hoping everyone can join us next week at 7 p.m. next Tuesday when we're at the Brick Hotel in Georgetown. So thank you all for joining us and Dr. Carroll, it's been a pleasure spending the evening with you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.